Okay, what I want to do now is let's start doing some unreal calculus. And by the way, uh, you know, I told you, you know, you've got the My Math Lab homework that's ready to go. Um, I didn't put any of these problems in the homework uh, because, again, I intended this to be review. Um, a lot of this stuff is going to, uh, we're not going to be doing a lot of this stuff in any explicit sense, uh, but we do have to have that basic understanding. Uh, what we're going to do now is the introduction of the true calculus part, and this is where our homework is going to start. This is the stuff that you're going to be responsible for uh, next week. <clears throat> and this is it. This is the fundamental concept. This is what separates calculus. Uh, you know, calculus is w w the beginning of what we call higher math, right? Geometry and algebra, those are considered lower math types. Uh, you know, those two fields were pretty well understood long before the modern era began. Um, but the limit and its consequences was not understood. This is what separates the uh, mathematics of the old world from the new world. And in point of fact, uh, you know, Newton, who invented calculus, really didn't have a, a fully formed idea of what the limit was. It took uh, about 100 years before uh, mathematicians were able to actually understand the limit process. Um, but let's go ahead. Uh, this is what it is. And this is the beginning of what we call higher mathematics. Um, so we have a function. Right? Calculus always begins with a function of some type. And where are my tools? Uh, so I've got a function, y equals f of x, and I've got two numbers, two values, a and l. So these are the components of a statement about limits. Um, l is the limit as x approaches a. Right, that's the way that this, this is the symbolism that represents this statement. L is the limit as x approaches a of f of x. That's what this is saying. What this means is the closer that x gets to a, the closer f of x gets to L. That's what this is intended to be saying. Uh, now this idea is kind of complicated, or at least the statement of this idea is relatively complex, but when we actually look at what it means, it's really a simple idea. Um, and if we're talking about our basic two-dimensional space, uh, so here's a picture of a function. So here's a function, y equals f of x. I'm going to choose some value for x. I'm going to call it a. Here's a. Okay. What I'm going to do now is uh, find, uh, so what I want to do, I want x to start from some point away from a and move toward it. Now, I can do that in two ways. <coughs> I can start over here on the, to the left. I can start over here to the left of A and start to move closer in this way. So uh, this is what we would call, and, and here's where I've made that designation. Uh, sorry, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, this is from the left-hand side. There's, if I'm in the, our basic two-dimensional graphing space, there's two ways A can be approached. I can get closer to it by moving left, uh, from the left towards it, or I can start to the right and move towards it, like so. Okay. This side is the limit as x approaches a from the left, so I put a minus sign there to show that I'm on the left-hand side of the point of the function f of x. Over here, if I'm on this side, I'm, I'm trying to get close to a then this is the limit as x approaches a from the right. I put a plus sign there to show you that I'm to the right in the sense that plus means to the right, minus means to the left of the function f of x. There's two ways I can get close to a. As x gets close to a, what's happening to f of x? Well, all I've got to really do is, uh, in the typical case at least, I'm just going to follow, uh, I'm going to look at the value, right? This point here, uh, this point is going to be the point A, F of A. Every point on the graph is A, F of A, no matter what A is. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and call this point L because what's happening as X gets closer to A? Well, for example, if I start here, then I'm starting way up here. I'm a little, I'm a, that far away from L. But every time I get closer to A, 
the function value is getting closer to L. The closer I get to A, the closer my function values are getting to L. Right? And very quickly. Much more quickly than in the other direction. So starting from here, I'm getting closer and closer to the value of L, which in the typical case is just the function value. Now we're going to see some pathological cases in a little while, but normally this is the way things work out. If on the other side, what's happening? Same thing, except now I'm coming from below. Starting from this point here, I'm this far away from L. Every time I let X get closer to A, the function values are getting closer to L. They're rising as X moves from right to left. This is hard to draw because um, things get kind of squished together really quickly. But I can see that same progress. The progress along the uh, x-axis where the independent variable is changing is forcing the dependent variable to approach the value of the function, which is a limit value that we call L. Um, shoot, I got a, yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, I got a little program that, that shows this a little bit more clearly. Uh, I didn't pull it up today. I'll, I'll do that next time. Um, but I think uh, this is sufficient to communicate what's going on here. Uh, and by the way, uh, uh, there's a couple of things here. Uh, this point here that X is approaching, this is called the limit point. And L is called the limit value. So every limit has two unknowns, two constants associated with it, a point that X approaches and a value that the function approaches. Uh, so in that sense, um, and again, in the typical case, this is a pretty straightforward idea. Uh, the function is built just so this happens. The closer I get to A, the closer the function value is getting to F of A. Now we're going to see examples of where this breaks down, but that's pretty much the idea behind the limit. Um, intuitively, I hope, it's a pretty straightforward notion, and one reason that it probably took so long to develop is that it seems pretty obvious, right? It doesn't seem that there's any mystery here or any sort of analysis that we need to understand why this is a significant idea. It doesn't seem significant at all. It seems obvious in a sense. Okay. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, the function x plus 1, what's the limit as x approaches 2 of that function? Um, let's draw a picture of it. Let's go ahead and draw a picture. How do I draw this graph? What kind of a graph is this? Is this? It's line. Um, what's the uh, slope of this line? One. Uh, what's the y-intercept? One, right? Mx plus b, m is one, b is one. So this is a line. It uh, has a y-intercept of one and a slope of one. So I don't know. Maybe it looks like this. Okay. Here's the limit point two. What's the function value at two? What is that value going to be? Three. All right? X is two. Two plus one is three. So as X gets closer to two, from either direction, what is the function value is getting closer to? Three. There. That's all there was to it. In fact, all I really did. Sorry, as X approaches 2. All I really did was I replaced the variable with the limit point and I did the computation. Again, in the typical case, that's exactly the way it works out. Our limit point and our limit value are linked. 
to the basic relationship of a the function's independent variable to its dependent variable. There's a picture of it. I can look at that picture and I can see. And again, uh, you know, uh, the idea here is that uh, you know if I I'm approaching along this curve, right? If I'm coming from the left hand side in this case, as I approach along this curve, or from the right hand side approaching along this curve, they're converging onto a common point. As I come down from up, uh, down from above, I'm getting closer and closer to three. As I come up from below, same function value again. In a lot of ways, this isn't a mystery at all. It's very straightforward. Uh, so with that in mind, um, what is this equal to? In fact, this is the typical case. Uh, this is our first limit law. In the typical case, the limit value is equal to the function value. So for this first example, what's the limit value going to be equal to? One, right? All I do is I do the substitution. Minus one squared plus minus one plus one. There's no difference between doing the substitution and the, or the uh, valuation and the limit. They're the same thing. So this is plus one, this is minus one, they cancel. So there, that limit is equal to one. What's this one equal to? Our cosine function. What's the limit as x approaches pi over four of the cosine function? Well, if I'm doing this according to the typical case, I should just be able to reconstruct the evaluation. I substitute the limit point for the variable. Can you tell me what cosine of pi over 4 is? Thank you. That's the kind of thing we're going to need to know. Um, now, I do have a, um, if you were in the class with me in the, the pre-calculus 2, I've got the trig wheel. I'm going to make that available to you. Uh, if you guys, uh, I'll bring that uh, next time. Uh, some of you guys, if you weren't with me before, uh, I don't. We're going to need these trig values. We're going to need to be able to re re recover them arbitrarily. So um, I don't expect you to memorize them all, but I do expect you to be able to read the wheel so that when you need these valuations, they'll be available to you. Um, oh, so uh, again, I, I do expect uh, that you're going to have some familiarity with the trig functions. Now, here's another function I hope you have some familiarity with. Here's the, uh, the logarithm. Exponents and logarithms we cover in pre-calculus 1. We're going to be making a lot, especially the logarithm function. It ha turns out it has some very significant properties. Uh, what is this one equal to? Well, substitute. What is the log, natural log of 1 equal to? Zero. Good. Uh, that actually can be done in your calculator. Um, but uh, I hope that you, uh, you know, and again, when, when the time comes, we'll do some review of the logarithm. But I hope that's something you already know. For any log base, the log of 1 is always equal to zero. Okay, so there's an example of some logarithms of uh, simple functions, complicated functions. Again, no mystery about how the limit works itself out. All I've got to do is the substitution. I replace the variable with the limit point, figure out what it's equal to, boom, that's the answer. Okay. Okay, here's where the problem comes. What I'm going to do now, let's see, how, how are we doing? Okay, uh, I, we've got, there's three what I'm going to call pathological cases, cases where this whole thing starts to break down. The first case is a function that has a gap in it. This function has a gap. Uh, around the point where x is 3, the function breaks off and takes up at a point at some other location. So what can we say about this? Um, in fact, what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down. Oh, first of all, looking at this graph here, what is f of 3 equal to? Three. 3. How do I know that? Well, just like we said before, f of 3 is the y-coordinate of the point where x is 3. 
This point here is the point where x is 3. Please notice that I've got uh, an open circle at the bottom branch and a closed circle on top. Right? We do that to indicate the function value. I can't fill in both of those points. That would give me two points with the same x coordinate. Uh, so make sure you understand that device. The point on this graph where the x coordinate is 3 is the point 3, 3. And that means that coordinate must be what f of 3 is equal to. So in this case, f of 3 is equal to 3. Okay. Now we're going to have to make, look at this more carefully. Um, let's start with this. What is the limit of this function as x approaches 3 from the left? So I'm going to come into this function from the left-hand side, starting at a point uh, over here. Or, yeah, well, let's do it this way. Starting from here, I'm going to start moving closer and closer to 3. How is the function value behaving as I get closer to 3? It's getting closer to 2. I can't get beyond 2, right? This is the cutoff point right here. The closer I get to 3, the closer these function values are getting to this lower cutoff point. The lower cutoff point is at 2. So these functions, as I move from the left-hand side, are approaching the uh, cutoff point for the lower branch. So this limit is equal to 2. So here's an example of a function whose limit value does not correspond to its function value. OK, so what if I approach 3 from the other direction? What if I'm coming in from the right-hand side? What is f of 3 going to be equal to? 3. Now I'm coming from this direction. Starting from the left-hand side, I'm coming along this upper branch. Now I can't get below that upper cutoff point at 3. So now I'm looking at this. I'm coming in from the, upper, uh, from the top down towards that point. The closer I get to uh, 3 in this direction, the closer the function values are getting to 3. So this gap here uh, keeps these two limit uh, these two directions from actually meeting. Right? The gap between these functions, uh, the gap between these two branches, is a gap between those limit values. Now, please notice in this case, this does end up being equal to the function value. Okay. But the problem is that this is not one thing. As I come from the left-hand side, I get 2. To come from the right-hand side, I get 3. So here's an example of where these two limits don't meet up. So the limit from the left, <coughs> oh, and by the way, that's not f of 3, so it's the f of x. Uh, the limit from the right-hand side does not equal the limit from the other side. So the left and right limits do not end up being the same thing. In this case, the conclusion is the limit does not exist. Okay? Uh, and we'll use this abbreviation DNE. We'll see this a lot. Does not exist. So, this is one example of what can go wrong. Uh, where the limit value starts to deviate from the function value. Anytime a function has a gap between branches, that means that these two limits can't be brought together. They're separated permanently. If I can't bring them together, then I can't compute the limit. And that means the limit can't be said to exist. Oh, by the way, uh, what about this? Uh, for this function, what's the limit as x approaches 1? What's that equal? zero. Right? If I'm approaching one, then I'm talking about this point. I'm coming in from above from the left. I'm coming up from below from the right. But those two limits are converging <laughs> to the same point. There's no gap there. So that limit is equal to zero, which is exactly the same as the function value. Again, that's a typical case. But here's the first example of pathology of functions where the limit process breaks down. This gap between branches forces the limit values to deviate 
and that means we can't complete the process. So here's our first example of a limit that doesn't exist. Okay, uh, I think I'm going to stop there. Yep. Uh, we have two more cases of pathology to look at, uh, and that's going to uh, pretty much fill out uh, the, the, uh, the complicating uh, issues. Again, I've posted all these notes in advance. You can look at this stuff. You can print this out and bring it with you if you want to uh, follow along with me as we go through this stuff. Uh, you can get a preview of what's to come. Um, homework's open. It's ready to go. You've got two free weeks, even if you don't have your um, code now. Follow the instructions on the handout. Make sure you go to the right location, right? The My Math Lab link in the, I think I said this, My Math Lab link in the website. It's not the same link that you register with. Follow the instructions on the handout. So get started with the homework. Wednesday we'll finish up this material. By next Monday you should have completed the first homework assignment. We'll have our first quiz and then we'll move on to the next set of material. Okay? Okay. Have a good rest of the day and I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>